So again, welcome. Uh, my name is Dr. Laura Stachel. I'm the Executive Director of We Care Solar. And if you're um, online with us right now, you're here for a webinar called The Power of Research. Um, we're really gonna have an excellent discussion today. Um, I'm going to be introducing to you some of our panelists. Um, I am myself and the co-founder of We Care Solar, and I've been doing research in the area of healthcare electrification for about 12 years now. Uh, I'm joined by Christina uh, Brigleb, who is our Senior Global Programs Director, who's been with We Care Solar for six years and leading all of our research efforts. We have Tom Hall, who is the Head of Global Philanthropies at UBS. They've been a very important funder for our research, and he'll be talking about just the importance of data to the donor community. We have the Executive Director of One Heart Worldwide Nepal, that's Surya Bhatta who's with us and he'll be talking about some of the work that we've done together in Nepal and the challenges of reaching last mile communities. And finally, we're joined by senior, uh, senior program director of Pathfinder Nigeria, Farouk Jega, who has been working with us for many years now. He's a, a long-term friend of We Care Solar. And he'll be talking about some of the comprehensive maternal child health care research that has included solar suitcases um, that has been conducted by Pathfinder. So just to give you a little bit of background, um, I myself was a graduate student after being a gynecologist obstetrician for many, many years, I went back to graduate school to study public health. And at that time I joined the University of California Berkeley School of Public Health and they were doing a, a, a collaborative research program with a university in Northern Nigeria, Amadou Bello University Teaching Hospital about trying to understand some of the factors leading to the very high rates of maternal mortality in Northern Nigeria. Um, and so as an obstetrician, I was asked to actually work on a project that was looking at observations in a hospital. This is a hospital in Northern Nigeria called Kofengayan Hospital. It was a state hospital doing about 150 deliveries every single month. And you'll notice that there's actually power lines and this is the surgical theater. There's actually a generator behind the operating theater. However, one of the factors that I um, was soon introduced to was that the hospital did not have continuous power. Despite the generator and the power lines, uh, it turned out that the hospital only had power about 12 hours a day. And I was really shocked to see how this affected care. Much of my work was qualitative. I would actually interview staff. This is one of the hospital doctors. And I spent probably 10 to 14 hours a day in this room. This is labor and delivery. And this was a referral hospital that would accept patients with very severe complications. Um, and all of them were first treated or evaluated in this room and actually deliveries would happen in this room. Um, one of the issues that was related to the lack of electricity is that when a emergency surgery was needed, like a cesarean section, the hospital could not use power to turn on their lights, to be able to use suction devices, to be able to use cautery to try and minimize bleeding during surgery. The lack of electricity also meant that communications were delayed. This was a woman who needed an emergency cesarean section and the only method they had to reach doctors in the event of an emergency was to send someone, uh, a person to personally look around the hospital and see if they could find a doctor or to go to the doctor's home and try and bring them back. So it was a courier system rather than any type of an intercom or phone system. And this was before cell phones were quite as ubiquitous as they are now. And at nighttime when the power is down, this is exactly what the maternity ward looked like. This is a nurse at her own desk. You can see she has more than one kerosene lantern. And even with both of those lights, you can't see that there are 12 patients behind her. Um, there are babies, family members, staff in the room, and everyone was in complete darkness. And I was absolutely shocked by what I saw. Um, it really affected me greatly. And many of you know the rest of the story that this led us to actually develop a solar electric solution for the hospital. And before bringing that solution, we actually created a demonstration kit that I could pack in my suitcase and bring with me. And this is me working with a couple of the doctors that I worked with, Dr. Mwazo in the middle, I believe might even be on this call, which is very exciting for me. And Instead of phones at the time, we brought in walkie talkies and we brought in LED lights and we really needed to see whether or not the health workers themselves would 
appreciate this type of system? Was this what was going to work for them? So we brought in different types of lights. I was trying to test whether LED lights would be sufficient for doing um, deliveries. This is labor and delivery. We brought in headlamps, which we wanted to see if that was going to help health workers as they were doing some of their evening tasks. We brought in uh, flashlights at time. This is a solar powered flashlight on the right that we brought into the pediatric ward that was used to start intravenous lines, other lights to try and help people with medical documentation. And we brought in lights that were eventually supplied to the operating theater to allow surgeries to happen throughout the night. In addition to just observing and trying to understand how light was affecting people, I also wanted to know whether or not the technology was appropriate. So a lot of our work was the gun visiting health facilities that received these small solar kits to see what their feedback was. And that allowed us to start shaping our technology. And we also uh, very much cared about the kind of documentation people did. Obviously, when you're doing research, it's important to check data. And so I learned a lot from actually looking at the records that health workers were keeping, both the individual patient reports, as well as registries, which the hospitals in Africa use to summarize the monthly data um, of all the patients who are delivering. In addition, I conducted some focus groups to try and understand from the health worker perspective, how did they think light was affecting their care? You can see in the background, there's kind of a cobbled together solar electric kit. That was the first one that we put into the hospital. But in this particular instance, I was trying to speak with the midwives themselves who are pictured here to have them tell me the ways in which they thought the new light was changing care. And so all of that was really the precursor to the foundation or to the to formation of We Care Solar. And it really led us to start a nonprofit organization that you all know right now. Um, let me go ahead and stop these slides for a moment. And who I'd like to introduce right now is Christina Briegleb, who is, as I mentioned, the Senior Global Programs Director of We Care Solar. Um, because it was a big surprise to me when I first did my qualitative research that there was even an issue with electrification in health facilities. But one would think that if I was just to tell you, do you think it would be harder for doctors to work in darkness, for, uh, darkness versus in light, that's a pretty obvious conclusion that yes, it's gonna be a lot harder. So some people might ask, why do we even bother doing research on something that we would imagine would have a very obvious conclusion? So Christina, can you address that a little bit? Why has We Care Solar been pursuing research on something that we would think would have an obvious answer? Yeah, it's a very good question and, and certainly one that we think a lot about. I think there's a number of factors to consider um, one is the severity and scope of the problem. Um, you know, research is really the basis for policy decision. And you really need data to show that there's a problem and also to demonstrate that there's a solution. When Laura started this work, you know, there was virtually no research or evidence that lighting could even affect maternity care. And even now, there's not a lot of information on how many facilities around the world have access to reliable lighting and electricity. So one, we want to really show that, that the problem is severe and the, and the scope is huge. The second reason that it, uh, to do research that seems kind of obvious and intuitive is that we want to quantify the true impact of our solution, our proposed solution. You know, we're looking at a number of different things. Of course, maternal mortality is our ultimate goal. So we're taking a look at that. But there's a lot of other things that we're trying to quantify. We want to understand how does lighting and electricity affect care? Does it um, cause delays? Does it cause uh, poor quality health, um, poor quality of care? Does it affect referrals? Uh, we look at things like how does it affect the health worker um, themselves? Um, and this is really one that we uh, did a lot of research on. So is there a lack of confidence? Do they face fear of nighttime, um, nighttime deliveries? Do they have low morale? And I think actually this issue is really important because I think health workers have been able to um, manage or circumvent sometimes the challenges at night and they're very creative and innovative of doing that. Sometimes that, that problem then is written off as it's not a, as much of a need or a priority. And then we're also quantifying how does it affect access to care? So if, if there's lighting and electricity at the facility, do we see an increased use of services, um, healthy seeking behavior? Does it affect the hours of operation? So when you start to drill down into those areas, you can see that there's a lot that we actually want to quantify. Um, and then once we have data on both the, the scope of the problem and, and quantifying the solution, um, that really can make a greater case for policy changes and for, for um, 
proposing solutions to government, to policymakers. And then lastly, I'd say that, you know, one reason that we actually do quite a bit of research too, and, and recently we under, underwent a, an RCT, the Randomized Controlled Trial. We did that in partnership with Innovations for Poverty Action and Harvard School of Public Health in Uganda. And one of the reasons we did that kind of level, that, you know, the highest gold standard of evidence is also for us to have such rigor, rigorous evidence that it can open doors to new donors potentially as well. So those are kind of some of the reasons that we, we think a bit about for why, why we want to do research on something so obvious. Great. And, and Christina, what are the ways in which we're actually measuring impact? What are some of the ways that, um, you know, what are the indicators that you've looked at and, and things that you are using in order to show whether there is change from the intervention itself? Yeah, so I think, you know, we, we develop a theory of change. So we, we have, you know, an idea of if we do this, these are the types of outcomes that we would expect. And for us, our ultimate goal is to reduce maternal and newborn mortality and morbidity. That's a very lofty goal. You know, there's a lot of challenges with collecting data, both at, the, at that level. Um, Laura will speak to this, and I know Farouk will speak to this, but there's a lot of challenges at that level. And when you really want to address maternal mortality, it's at the population level. You need really big programs to make a huge change in maternal mortality. So then, of course, we're going to collect data on that, but we're going to think of, okay, what are the factors that lead to maternal mortality? And we call these kind of proxies. So for example, we know that access is a real issue. If you can get more people to deliver at the facility, we see reduction in maternal mortality. So looking at things like access. Um, just because we get women to deliver at the facility doesn't mean though that maternal mortality decreases. You need to also have quality and skilled care. So we look at things like the quality of care that, that the um, patients are receiving. Looking at things like pattern of referrals. Um, you know, are we able to get when there's an emergency case, a referral to the next level that's appropriate? Um, so those are some of the things that we look at um, as well. And then I think one, one thing when we think about impact, and I think one thing, you know, Laura, you talked a lot about the qualitative research you did initially. We really take a mixed methods approach to measuring impact for us. Um, I think a lot of times we focus just on the quantitative, so looking at the data, looking at utilization, and of course that is really important, but um, we've really taken an approach of, of also including uh, qualitative research. Qualitative research is the textual data. It's descriptive. It, it helps us understand the underlying reasons, the questions of why and how. And I think for me, it's a much more nuanced approach to analysis and describing impact. You know, we can, we can quantify, you know, this is the number, this is the minutes of delay that a, a patient will have if they don't have light. But when you interview and you start to do some qualitative research, you understand the chaos and the challenges that health workers face when they're in a room in complete darkness and a health worker has a phone in, in her mouth as the only source of light, can't communicate to the patient because she has a light source in her, in her mouth. And potentially there's a family member that's standing next to the patient holding a light in the room. And you start to understand the chaos and the nuance that happens when you use qualitative research. So I think we would have missed a lot if we hadn't done kind of both quantitative and qualitative. And then lastly, I would just say for thinking about how to measure impact, I think fortunately with Laura's initial research and the fact that we've continued to do research now celebrating a decade of research, unfortunately we've seen though consistent results across that whole decade as well as across a number of different countries. So, you know, we've collected a, a huge body of literature and we're seeing the same kind of results, the same challenges are being faced in a number of different countries and still to this day. And so we can feel really confident that we've kind of reached what they call data saturation. We know that we're seeing consistent results across a number of different places. Yeah, let me just, let me just um, expand on that a little bit. So some of the research that Christine is mentioning is research that she and I have done literally reviewing um, more than a thousand health worker interviews. So for baseline data, we have 1,200 interviews with health workers that are allowing us to understand what were the conditions like for them before receiving any type of solar intervention. And these were across 11 countries and across 10 years. And one of the things that we did as an experiment, we blinded ourselves. Instead of saying, oh, this one's from Nepal, this one's from Nigeria, we just took away the countries. And literally you could not tell looking at the quotes whether it was someone in Zimbabwe or Tanzania or Nepal or the Philippines. Health workers, who, whether they were nurses or doctors or midwives, they all had the same sense of frustration, demoralization, fear, 
not having light and had the same types of challenges. And so I think when you were talking about how ubiquitous these challenges are, I really feel like we have the evidence to back that up. Um, you mentioned a lot of different types of research. I think you were gonna share a slide uh, about you know, showing a little bit more about the types of research we do. Let me see if I can bring that up for us, okay? And for people who are just joining, um, we do want this to be somewhat interactive. And so it would be terrific if you would like to um, ask any questions, you can put that in the chat and there will be times later on where your questions can be addressed. All right, can you see this, Christina? I can, thank you. Great. So um, why is research important to us? You know, I think as an organization, um, Weaker Solar really values research. And I strongly believe that collecting and using data can be a very powerful tool so there's a number of different ways it's, it's important to us. You know, Laura and I just talked a bit about how it describes the problem and it can really quantify the impact of our solution to the problem. Um, we, it also optimizes product design and use. So in our first series, um, The Power of Design, we talked a lot about how research went into the design and making sure that it's, it's applicable and useful for the users. Likewise, when you have a product we want to monitor that the solar suitcases are working and that they're being used over time. We don't want them just to be working initially and used initially. We want to make sure that the product is, is used for a long time. I'll talk a bit more about this, but we've really used research to drive program implementation and organizational strategy. And as we discuss, it's, it's really informing global advocacy. So we're really making a case that thinking about maternity care needs to include access to reliable lighting and electricity. Uh, next slide, Laura, please. So how do we use research? Um, this is very similar, but uh, you know, we use it in program design, so the way that we implement programs. Um, we use it to confirm that our intervention is effective. I think that's a really important thing. We have theories that this will impact care, but we really need to confirm is that, is that the case. Um, as we spoke about, it improves the product and user experience. We demonstrate impact to our partners and our donors. Um, we really can use it to do evidence-based program design and implementation, and then of course, advocacy. Um, if you can go to the next slide, I'm gonna talk a bit more about that evidence-based um, um, way that we do things. So one thing I think that's quite unique to We Care Solar is what we call best practices. Um, so we've done actually three rounds where we've evaluated all of our programs imp and implementation to come up with a set of evidence-based recommendations and guidelines for how we, we operate programs. Um, so we've done this three times and quite a, uh, quite a bit of methodology went into it. So we, we conducted partner surveys, we conducted interviews with key informants, we reviewed all of our programs and partners, all of our internal documents. We did a cost and time analysis. And then we looked to see, is there other research available already on global strategies for scaling? And the first time we did this was in 2015. And it was really kind of laid the groundwork for the way that we currently do programs. Um, it, it laid to, you know, we looked at all of our program activities and came up with best practices. And to kind of illustrate what I'm talking about with how this is implemented, one example of a lesson we learned was um, clearly, you know, larger programs are the most time and cost efficient. You know, we started as a small organization and as we grew, we realized that we couldn't be pulled in so many different directions and so many different partners and countries and programs. And we've really learned that when, when you do high volume programs, it leads to the higher quality programming. Similar to that was this idea of aiming to saturate an entire district. It makes sense when let's say we work with a partner or government and, and they have 30 solar suitcases they may want to distribute them across a number of different districts, but that can really lead to um, inefficient implementation. It's much harder for um, all of the partnerships with government, implement, installation, monitoring and evaluation, and then importantly, monitoring those suitcases to make sure that they're, they're working well. Um, so, so this really led also to the concept of light every birth. And I think there's an equity issue too, ensuring that everyone in a district before we leave, make, making sure that every facility has access to light. Another example that we learned was it's really important to proactively initiate partnerships and especially with mission aligned partners. We know that the solar suitcase has an impact itself, but it has a much greater impact when you pair it with other interventions. And uh, Farouk will speak a bit about that of our work in Nigeria. In 2016, then we updated our best practices and just to highlight a few lessons we learned there, 
you know, we used to work a lot with our NGO partners and they would um, conduct a lot of the clearance for us. And I think shipping and clearance continues to be kind of a very challenge, big challenge for us. And so we learned that we need to really rely on a third party logistics firm that has the expertise in the area to do that and not rely on our, our NGO partners um, who were really struggling with that. Likewise, we used to train a lot of our NGO health staff to conduct installations for us. But we've learned that if you really want to have um, timely quality and efficient installations, it's best to pay um, subcontractors who have experience and a background in solar. So this rigorous kind of development of best practices really led to the concept of Light Every Birth. So, and launched the Light Every Birth initiative for us, which is really an initiative to ensure that no woman delivers in dark across an entire country. Um, and from that, we developed 21 recommendations that we are currently using for our implementation in our Light Every Birth countries, which is Liberia, Sierra Leone, Zimbabwe, and Uganda. And just to illustrate some of the examples that we learned from that, um, it's really important to conduct a landscape analysis. So we have a strong, rigorous methodology for how we consider countries where we work. And then once we decide on one, really making sure that we understand what is the government doing to improve electrification um, and maternal child health? Who are the big players that we could potentially work with so that we can go into the country with the best information available? We also learned that now that we're working at a national scale and we're directly partnering with government, it's really important to formalize those relationships through agreements or MOUs. And then, of course, we, we know this, but, you know, formulating a plan for sustainability from the start. We don't want that conversation around sustainability to be an afterthought or something that happens once the suitcases maybe need replacement batteries. We want it to be from the beginning so that it's a priority from the start. So hopefully this kind of gives an overview that, you know, research is really important to We Care Solar and that there's various ways that we've used it to improve the way that we operate. Well, thank you. I thought that was that was a very helpful overview. Um, so we've we've talked about the kinds of research. We've given one example of, I guess, what we would call process research, really looking at our own processes to understand how we could be more effective as an organization. Um, but I think a lot of people are particularly interested in research that really is helping us understand health outcomes for mothers and for newborns. And for that, I really want to call upon um, our guest panelists, both Surya and Farouk. Um, let's start with you, Surya Bhatta, who is the Executive Director of One Heart Worldwide Nepal. Um, can you talk to us about just some of the actual challenges of trying to gather data, particularly in Nepal, where you have very remote centers? Tell us about what it is like literally trying to reach these facilities and then trying to collect data so we can understand more of the hows of doing this kind of research. Can you hear me? Perfectly. Yes, so uh, thank you for the opportunity to join this great conversation. And, you know, I have been in this, you know, this project since 2015, since the earthquake, really. Um, so, you know, you already mentioned the remoteness and challenges, you know, which is one of the, you know, key challenges we face, you know, getting the uh, real-time data information is always a challenge, you know, those health facilities far apart. You really need to work, you know, several hours to even days in to get those places where you really have the most need. So, you know, that is one, you know, big challenge we face. And where we work right now, these districts are pretty, you know, remote and you know, very far away from the, you know, med district uh, head 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 uh, district head headquarters. And more than that, you know, if you really want to have a data that is, you know, useful for you know making the decisions, you know we need to have a people to train who you know who can really get the information we need and sometimes you know our information systems are not very aligned with the you know the your need you know the because we we have to re see the you know, record reviews and you know whatever available in the health facility sometimes they are not kept well it is a paper based of course you know you need to go through one by one you know register from last in a few years maybe those data are not available or maybe not accurate, you know, or not really match the your criteria. So this is something we faced uh, largely when we, you know, when we collected those information Krishna mentioned earlier. Uh, you know, I think One Heart is one of the you know major partner on this uh, project, um, and also you know the follow up to be made by the phone, uh, you know, and sometimes it 
it can be very biased, you know, and it's a lot of effort for our team to get those information from the field because, you know, timing is they're not available or, you know, when, you know, you really wanted to measure the real you know, need uh, through the phone versus when you make a field visit is always different because the expectations from the health workers are always different. You know, if you ask something means, you know, they might consider you are going to support that, you know, in the future. So if they have some, you know, if they don't, they have it, or if someone has a backup, you know, solar in their health facility, they might say, oh, we don't have a solar or we don't have, you know, we have a problem. So these are the really the, you know, key challenges we face. Um, of course, you know, we lack, you know, we lack a lot of, you know, information because we don't have, a, you know, proper, you know, recording reporting system, electronic reporting system. So you can just go in the computer and just, you know, extract those information. So that is a lot, lot of, you know, hard work to do uh, for our team. And sometimes, you know, last time when we sent the team there uh, to install the data, uh, install the solar suitcase, we try to train them. But those people don't understand what is the internet visit means, you know, what is this? So our team has to navigate that a lot. You know, we do have a team out in the field, you know, who is very, you know, has a close proximity. They provide some support, but, uh, you know, it's always difficult for the people who doesn't have a medical background to really get the, you know, some of the technical, you know, uh, information from the health facilities. So these are the really the key challenges we see in our project here. Saria, you brought up so many important points and things that I, I think we should be following up on. Um, for one, I think just talking about the difficulty in trying to get accurate data. I know that when I had first uh, started in Nigeria, if a woman died, and in this particular hospital I worked at, there were three to eight maternal deaths every single month. But when I would look at the records, I might not even see on a patient's record that she had died, or there might be a little tiny code in the corner, RIP for rest in peace. And so, uh, it was sometimes difficult to actually measure mortality. And Farouk, I know this is something that you've actually been facing with Pathfinder. Can you speak for a moment, Farouk, about just this whole challenge of measuring mortality, uh, maternal mortality, which is you know the thing that we're all most interested in changing is both mortality and morbidity. What's it been like for you to try and gather data in some of these facilities where there are paper-based records and maybe not the most accurate data as Surya was describing? You'll need to unmute Farouk. Thank you. Sorry, once again. Okay, you can hear me now? Yes. Thank you. Yeah, so Surya has already talked about, uh, you know, the remote uh, remoteness of most of these health centers. Uh, I think one of the key challenges is uh, there's usually a culture you know, or rather a lack of uh, culture of uh, documenting uh, these things. Uh, I, I, I know that a lot of the uh, rural health centers are manned by uh, community health extension workers in Nigeria, and these are the lowest uh, cadre uh, of health care providers. So they are usually poorly trained. Uh, they lack an appreciation of the importance of the data, you know, that they are collecting. Uh, they regard themselves as uh, really, really being overworked, you know. So it's uh, a matter of either, uh, uh, you know, doing the real work of saving lives, uh, you know, or documented. They cannot uh, fathom, uh, you know, and, uh, a middle ground, you know, where they do both the work, uh, you know, and then do the documentation. Uh, but, uh, you know, something interesting, I think, uh, that you mentioned is the fact that, uh, uh, you know, a lot of the... Uh, mortalities and even some severe morbidities go on uh, undocumented because uh, uh, you know these particular healthcare workers see it as a negative uh, you know disincentive uh, for them to to record uh, uh, this and for very good reason uh, for a very long time uh, supervisors uh, or supervision of these healthcare workers uh, was uh, a very very difficult thing uh, so the supervisors would come uh, check these registers and then find ways uh, to lay blames. Uh, and some providers have actually, uh, you know, been severely reprimanded uh, for, uh, you know, some of the work that uh, they, they did or, or they did not do, uh, you know. So, uh, 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 
you know, it's, it's a multi, uh, it's, it's a, there are multiple factors, uh, you know, there. And the challenge, you know, is very real in a rural health center that is very, very remote uh, with a healthcare worker that is very poorly trained. Uh, and, uh, you know, especially with an issue also uh, that is uh, culturally uh, very, very, very charged, you know, uh, mortalities uh, and especially maternal mortality. Uh, you know, as seen as, uh, uh, you know, taboos, you know, or, and, and nobody really wants to be, uh, uh, you know, associated with them. Providers that most certainly don't want to uh, document that their facility, uh, you know, is losing women at such a, a very, very alarming rate. And um, you had mentioned in the prep for this call that when you started collecting data, you saw something a bit unexpected in the maternal mortality rates. Can you mention? that again? Oh, uh, yeah, absolutely. So uh, we, we did a, 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 a pre-intervention assessment. Uh, you know, there were 100 and 812 uh, health facilities uh, that conducted deliveries in the last, in, in, the, in the one year prior to our intervention. And we assessed every single one of them uh, for their state of readiness uh, to provide uh, around the clock uh, emergency obstetric and newborn care. And uh, so we were pretty confident you know, that we knew what the main challenges were. And when we uh, started the intervention, we went around actually uh, you know, addressing uh, uh, you know, the issues and the challenges that we, we, you know, we saw from the assessment. Uh, two years into our intervention, uh, and we, we, we did, as you mentioned, it was a multi-stage uh, uh, you know, intervention. We provided... Uh, uh, not only supplies and equipment, uh, including infrastructure, you know, like uh, the, the Wikia solar lighting. Uh, we also did a lot of training of healthcare workers. We, we, we worked with the government to recruit uh, uh, skilled providers in some of the remotest health facilities, you know. And despite, uh, you know, these investments worth uh, millions of dollars, uh, we were quite shocked uh, in the first two years of the intervention when we noticed that uh, maternal deaths were actually going, you know, higher, you know, than, than baseline. Uh, but it didn't take us a long time to realize that they are not, you know, the maternal deaths are not actually higher because even the communities were telling us that, uh, you know, uh, things have greatly improved. Less women were dying before intervention. What? Uh, really was the matter was that, uh, you know, pre prior to our intervention, you know, a lot of these deaths uh, went unrecorded uh, for some of the reasons, you know, that I mentioned. Uh, so if, if you were looking at our, uh, you know, the graph of our intervention, you know, you would see a huge spike uh, in, in maternal mortality and morbidities because for the first time uh, these were being recorded. Uh, and, uh, but uh, I'm, I'm happy to report, you know, that uh, five years later at end line, uh, you know, we were able to record uh, very significant decreases in both maternal and neonatal mortalities. Yeah, thanks for that explanation. And um, it's something that Christine and I face all the time is how much can you believe the data that is there? And Surya, you brought up the fact that these are paper records and we know that people are writing things down and then transferring that to other paper records that then maybe go to a ministry or someone else also then re-records and enters the data somewhere else. So there are all of these points where mistakes can be made. And that's if you even assume that they actually truly reported the real deaths. When you add into the component that you've told us about, Farouk, it might be that you're not even starting off with the correct baseline of deaths. Um, thanks for that. Surya, I wanna turn back to you. You were talking about the remoteness of these facilities and I know for all of us in the nonprofit space, and even for you, Tom, at UBS, we all want to have a lot of impact. We want to show that the things that we're doing are making a big difference. And some of those facilities that we know the solar suitcases have provided light to in Nepal have actually very few deliveries a month. So can you help us think about impact and why should we be putting such important donor resources into certain facilities where very low numbers of people may actually be impacted? Well, this is a great question. You know, we, we, we have to, you know, respond a lot of people and yes, you know, public health is, you know, numbers, you know, from, you know, what is your $1 per, you know, investment outcome or whatever we always calculate per life save or, you know, whatever, whatever, there is always some, you know, uh, measurement metrics. So, 
I think one of the things where we have to, you know, as a human or, you know, working in this philanthropy, what we have to all admit, you know, is like everybody gets, you know, equal opportunity to have a, you know, a dignified delivery. So everybody should feel safe, you know, whether that person lives in remote or, you know, poor or, you know, urban, wherever they live, you know, whatever their caste, gender, ethnicity, everybody deserves the safe delivery. You know, so our, you know, and also more than that from the impact perspective, if you see the gravity of the problem, you see more number, you know, more percentage or ratio or rate, whatever the measurement matrix you use, if it is metal, metal mortality, we call, you know, ratio. So if you see the number, you know, per, you know, per, per life, you know, death of maternal health or, you know, newborns, the gravity of problem is so high in those remote areas. Maybe the numbers are less, but if you see, you know, the total number of, you know, you know, total, you know, ratio is pretty high. So, you know, the investments should be seen from the how many lives saved. I think that is great, but also it should be seen from the, you know, everybody, you know, uh, everybody's uh, human right. It is equality. Everybody gets the equal opportunity to have a, you know, a safe birth. So those reasons where we, we work, you know, very remote, they don't have, a, you know, a good access of road. They don't have a access of, you know, basic infrastructure. So, you know, these places, I think, are really hard to raise, even for our team. You know, we do have a lot of challenges to retain our team because it is just so remote. You know, people don't want to leave, but I think we, as a, as a you know, we, we believe on the, you know, human, human, human right is important for everyone. So we really feel like supporting those, you know, left out communities, uh, you know, is very important compared to you, you know, go from, you know, like Bangladesh or India, where you have a millions of people and you can, you know, make huge impact. But, you know, I think we also need to see that everybody has to get, you know, equal opportunity. Thank you. And I know, Christina, you and I have talked about this because when we came up with the Light of Rebirth initiative and we have a whole country that we're trying to reach, there is gonna be different utilization in some of the facilities that are closer to urban areas than the ones that are most remote. Um, I'd like to turn to you, Tom, for a moment and, and get the donor perspective. I know that you're trying to get really the most impact you can for every donor dollar. Can you comment on what Surya was just talking about? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, so at UBS, we're the largest wealth manager in the world and kind of represent a, a large number of ultra high net worth, high net worth individuals, many of whom are, are looking to use their philanthropy to solve some of the pressing social and environmental problems the world's facing. And the, the reality is, you know, it's heartbreaking hearing some of these stories. I think none of us would want, you know, our, our partners or ourselves to be in a situation where you're trying to give birth in a situation where there's no light, you know, that the, the, these these problems need solving and they need solving quickly and that means you need to choose you know you need to try and choose between interventions that work and interventions that perhaps don't work and and the only way you can really uh, you know differentiate between between different nonprofits and and uh, you know social enterprises or even companies that are purporting to solve some of these health issues or, or global education issues around the world is through data ultimately you have to be able to prove that what you do works and you have to try and prove that in the best possible way you can, which is why you know, good quality data and measurement is critical. I think it's been super interesting hearing this conversation in the sense that, you know, what we often say to philanthropists is, do you even understand the problem in the first place? And I think a lot of what you've been talking about is that actually, you know, just getting to that basic understanding of what the problem is, 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 is really difficult and needs investment in research and data to understand that. And we've seen that in a number of examples in the, in the interventions that you know clients I've advised on um, ha have started to get engaged with, and that they they think they've got a ready-made solution, but if they just slow down a bit and go and understand the problem, what they'll find out is that the problem was the opposite of what they thought it was. <laughs> and I think that's what I, I I love a little bit about uh, uh, about We Care Solar because who'd have thought really it's quite counterintuitive that light could be this kind of causal. Uh, re link between maternal and, and child mortality and actually just just actually quite a cost effective intervention that can make a really big difference and I think ultimately what what you know what we search for in in in, in the kind of programs that we want to invest in is is things that can prove their cost per outcome I mean it was mentioned earlier a little bit from Sy Syria but um, 
how, how do we maximize you know the benefits the most number of people at the cheapest possible price and really and really prove that and I, I suppose just touching on that point around the most vulnerable communities like you mentioned in Nepal vis-a-vis -vis, um, maximum reach I think one should really look at this at a, at, a, at, a, at a sufficient enough scale that you can actually talk about like you have done in your light up every birth initiative you know what's the cost per outcome across the entire country which which factors in the more expensive areas and and the maybe more cost you know the more cost effective areas to get you your true cost of that kind of equitable access to to healthcare that most of us would would would, would expect and, and take for granted and should be available for, for some of the most vulnerable communities thank you so much so um other than you, everyone else who was on the panel is actually part of a nonprofit, and all of us are really interested in doing our jobs as well as possible, but we all rely on donors to do this work. And one of the things that I think has been so unique about UBS is that you have supported our work on researching the hardware of our product and how to make a better product. Um, how to look to see whether there was a business model that would allow us to move from nonprofit to, to for-profit sector? Is there some sort of a financial sustainability model that somehow we're missing by relying on donor funds? Um, you've certainly supported a lot of our impact work and you've supported even that work that Christina was describing. All of that best practices was supported by UBS. That's pretty unique to us in the nonprofit world to find a donor that will step up like that. Can you speak to why you were willing to make those kinds of investments, not just for us, but I know for lots of organizations? I think, I think for us, we and, and our clients are obsessed with scale because ultimately, if th there's not enough philanthropic dollars in the world to solve all of these issues like maternal and child mortality or the billion people who don't have access to healthcare, the sustainable development goals need two and a half trillion dollars a year. That's 25 trillion by 2030. Global philanthropy has about one and a half trillion available. We think it might grow to five, but it's still about a fifth of what's required, right? So, so, so how, if you're a philanthropist, should you think about that? The, the, the worst thing that can happen for a philanthropist is you invest in something, it's actually got great data and it's working, but you can't get it to scale. And, 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 and therefore it's gonna help a small number of people. So ultimately you only maximize your impact if you get to scale. So how do you get to scale? Well, we think there's two mechanisms or routes to scale. One is, and you touched on a little bit, for profit. So somebody buys your product. Why will they buy your product? Because you can prove it works. So data is kind of inherently uh, important for a, for a market-based solution. But the other way that you're likely to scale, and it was touched on earlier by Christina, is this concept of policy change. Ultimately, somebody else will buy your product, either a, either big, a big development agency or, or an international government or an in-country government will buy your product because it's a more cost-effective, more efficient, more effective way of, of uh, providing healthcare in rural areas and, and saving lives, ultimately. But how are you going to prove to those governments that your, your idea isn't just a crazy idea, it's something that is actually working and is actually either saving lives or making things more efficient or has this uh, contributory effect that is, 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 is worth them investing in. And the answer is good, is good data, ideally validated externally, not paid for by the organization itself, you know, with control. And I, re I recognize and hearing, you know, hearing all of your stories about just how hard that is, no one's pretending this is easy, but, but that's what you need. And what we often say to our um, kind of philanthropic investors and the clients we, we advise on is, you know, many philanthropists at an ind individual level don't want to fund research, right? They want to fund solar suitcases going out into a, in a clinic in Nepal. Well, great, good. I've funded a couple of those myself. It's, 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 it's good to do that. But if you don't invest in the data side of it, then you're, you're, you're underselling your own philanthropic investments on the front line because you're, you're not going to get that kind of, you know, important raw material of, of, you know, information that says that this is working and guys, we need to get the scaling. I'll give you one example where we did this. We did a, a randomized control trial with an education initiative, uh, Educate Girls in Northern India. And, and the data was so good in terms of them increasing learning outcomes by, you know, like four times the benchmark and some of the control groups that they went on to raise about $90 million in additional funding from, from, from other investors, simply off the back of one piece of research. 
and and we've seen this happen at a policy level. We had com a community health worker model, um, uh, uh, Muso, I think, in, in Mali that 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 showed a fifty percent reduction in child mortality, and it's gone on to be commissioned by the government as a kind of a, a primary model for for frontline health workers. So what I say to to philanthropic investors who are nervous about investing in research is this is like an equity investment. It's the best use of capital you can do alongside. The, the work on the ground to ensure that you don't just get a one for one return in terms of social value for your philanthropy, you get a you get a one to 1000 return. Boy, thank you. That was so succinct and, and really very helpful. Um, so you really say that as a donor, you want to make sure that this intervention is doing what it's supposed to be doing. And Farouk, you did a large program in Cross River State where it was a real multi-intervention study. So I'd like you to speak to that a little bit. And then maybe as a team, we can think, well, how do you tease out what part of that was actually a solar suitcase was helpful versus you know, the education that you did for the midwives? So why don't you set the stage for what that research was like? And then Christina, I'd like you to talk about a randomized control trial. Okay, so yes, we, uh, I mentioned that we, we did a you know, pre-interview intervention assessment of uh, 812 health facilities, uh, basically to understand uh, their set of readiness uh, for providing around the clock emergency obstetric and newborn care. Uh, and the, you know, the data uh, was, uh, you know, was the baseline we used, uh, you know, to organize uh, care uh, in, in different, uh, you know, clusters of health facilities. Uh, basically put in uh, three to four primary health uh, centers clustered around uh, a secondary or district hospital. Uh, and then, uh, you know, uh, using the cluster as the unit of managing uh, the whole, you know, the whole health system, whether it's uh, training, uh, supervision, uh, uh, you know, com commodity, logistics, uh, uh, you know, and, and other quality initiatives uh, and, and, you know, the, the, the interventions, or rather the inputs, uh, you know, were, were many. Uh, it is uh, uh, not always, uh, you know, easy uh, to say exactly what is the relative contribution of, of, uh, of uh, what. Uh, but I, I can say that we had a very clear idea, you know, about what the main issues were from our uh, uh, pre-intervention assessment. So for instance, uh, uh, you know, what the data showed us was that uh, uterotonics, uh, you know, were the number one reason uh, why those facilities were not, uh, uh, you know, adequately taking care of pregnant women. Postpartum hemorrhage, uh, uh, you know, because of uh, uterine atony uh, was the number one cause of maternal mortality. Uh, the second thing uh, was, uh, you know, lack of, uh, uh, adequate referrals, or rather, let me put it this way, lack of, uh, you know, transport to get to uh, a facility, you know, in time uh, for a life-saving intervention. Uh, the third thing was the very, very poor state of infrastructure. And I think uh, between, it was, a, it was a, a fight for third place between uh, power and, and uh, running water. Uh, a lot of the uh, uh, healthcare workers that we interviewed uh, in the qualitative studies that we did, uh, mentioned uh, that uh, you know one of the single most important interventions uh, was the fact that they now they could now attend to deliveries, including complications of deliveries uh, at night. Uh, a lot of them mentioned that uh, most of these complications, uh, you know, unfortunately came at night and previous previously. Uh, because they didn't have uh, well-lit uh, theaters and, and delivery rooms, uh, you know, they, they couldn't, uh, you know, really offer those women the best care, you know, that they could. Uh, so uh, even though, as I said, you can, uh, you know, can object, uh, you, you, it's difficult to objectively, uh, you know, measure the impact of each individual uh, intervention, uh, uh, you know, putting them uh, on a scale uh, you know, especially according to uh, what the providers or what the uh, health system managers uh, deemed, you know, to be the most important ones, uh, can give you uh, an idea, you know, about uh, uh, what were the most uh, critical interventions. So most definitely 
uh, provision of heterotonics, uh, uh, provision of uh, emergency transport systems, uh, and then uh, provision of uh, critical infrastructure, including power and water supply, uh, ranked amongst the most important interventions, uh, according to the uh, healthcare managers that we interviewed. Thank you. So just for everyone else, there have been three different really multi-intervention studies similar to the one that Farouk has mentioned. The one he mentioned is in Nigeria. Pathfinder did another similar uh, collection of interventions in Tanzania, and AMREF did something similar in Uganda. And in those studies, we saw decreases of maternal mortality on the order of 50 percent, uh, institutional death rates going down by 50 percent, and we also saw similar decreases in newborn mortality. Uh, and perinatal mortality, somewhere between 50 and 70% in those studies. Christina, how do we assess the attribution of light to this really complex equation? Yeah, so in these multi-interventions, you have a number of different factors going in to improve maternal and child health. And it's really hard to distill exactly what impact does the solar suitcase alone have? And I think that's actually one of the reasons that we wanted to do a randomized controlled trial um, it's considered the gold standard. It produces the highest level of evidence and it does that by eliminating bias. Um, when you randomize, um, it reduces bias. So there's things that are confounding factors. They could lead to the outcome. And so when you have two groups that are randomly assigned, you're hoping that the difference or you're checking that the differences between those groups aren't the reason that you might observe any sort of change. It's actually due to the intervention. And that was one of the reasons that we really wanted to do the RCT was to see um, what impact does the solar suitcase alone have on maternity care? And uh, while I can't speak to the results yet, they are under review for publication. I can say that they are similar to the results that we've seen with the qualitative research. And we do hope that those will be published um, in the forthcoming couple months. Right, so I think it was really interesting for us, but we also know that there were certain limitations to the RCT, for example, um, they were not including the highest risk, risk patients Anyone coming in with a complication was not considered. In this particular RCT, we had health workers literally observing care in health facilities that did or did not have solar suitcases. And we watched over time as all the facilities ended up getting the suitcases. But as far as the rigor was concerned, they actually did not want to have patients that were too young or patients with complications or patients who arrived late in labor. Some of the extreme cases where you actually see more complications, more morbidities, and even more mortalities. Um, and so we were able to get very interesting results, but there are limitations to the RCT at the same time. Christina, very briefly, share with us what's up next in terms of research for We Care Solar, and then I'm going to open it up for questions to the audience. Great. So as I mentioned, we are in the process of publishing several papers. Our, the RCT will have several papers. Laura and I have done some qualitative work that we're hoping to publish. Um, aligned with our best practices approach, we hope to do another round um, of best practices for our Light Every Birth initiative. Uh, we want to really understand the sustainability model and making sure that we have um, best practices for exit strategies and long-term success. Um, we're really interested in looking at how COVID-19 is impacting maternity care. I think we know from the Ebola epidemic that there will be impacts and we're already seeing that. So understanding how does lighting and electricity um, affect COVID-19 prevention and management. And we actually are piloting this year as well, um, including thermometers with a solar suitcase. So we want to see if that is having an impact. We're exploring adding refrigeration to frontline health centers. I know this is a big request. Refrigeration allows for vaccination and various other things. So looking to see if we can add that on. And then lastly, we're looking um, to do more research on our remote monitoring. Uh, remote monitoring is, uh, is in our new version of the solar suitcase. And essentially it allows using a cellular network for us to get data in real time remotely on whether the suitcase is working, how the health workers are using it. And it's really an exciting new direction for us. We used to have to collect that data either physically on papers by interviewing health workers or actually going to the facility and collecting a, a SD card or a sensor that would tell us that data. But now we have the capability and we're seeking funding to be able to do that uh, moving forward remote monitoring. Okay, well, thank you. Um, this is your time to ask questions of any of these wonderful experts who are here. Uh, we had one request to ask a question from Benjamin Kayanji. If you could unmute yourself, uh, you are welcome to share your question. Uh, thank you so much, Aurora. Um, mine is not a question as such, but um, 
sharing experience, which would uh, serve uh, part of the um, research. I am an installer um, in Uganda here. So um, about the remote, uh, remote located health facilities, you find that uh, in a village, there is one facility that has a very high catchment population. Why? Because it is, it is located close to a center and most of the people come from different, different areas from their villages to come where there is light. So to these facilities that are deep Uh, sorry, it seems like we lost him right now. So Benjamin, go ahead and let us know if you have, if you do come back on. Um, we have another comment here from Shrita from Nepal, who says, in the context of Nepal, the solar suitcase is used 24-7 during delivery, especially to check things like perineal tears and cervical tears, because the light intensity is very good and durable. And I think that's a really good point that she brings up, because uh, we think about light being important at night, but actually in obstetric care, and particularly in a lot of the health clinics we serve, there may not be terrific light for doing all of the things that are really necessary to provide life-saving care. For example, if someone is bleeding from the uterus or from the cervix, that's something where you need to have a light that is really directed exactly where it's needed. And that's one of the things that through our research, we care solar said, you know, having an overhead light is really not completely adequate in the delivery room. You need a mobile light. You need headlamps to allow people to see, and that even during daytime hours, these lights can be very, very helpful. So thanks for that comment. Uh, go ahead and put additional questions in chat. We have a few more that we've thought of while we're waiting for some um, from the audience. Um, you had talked a little bit, uh, Surya, about bias, and I thought that was actually quite interesting. It's something that we think about too, this issue of whether or not when we're interviewing health workers, uh, what are their motivations? And are we, when we're doing research, really considering you know, where they're coming from? Christina, do you wanna speak a moment to some of the bias issues that we considered when we were doing our qualitative research? Yeah, I think it's a really important thing to be aware of and think of when, when conducting research, how are you gonna manage it, either in the design of the research or in your analysis? And just to give an example of some of the biases for, for We Care Solar, um, we conduct health facility assessments and we, we either call the facilities or we're collecting data. So when, when we're calling as a representative from We Care Solar and talking to health workers about um, access to electricity and, and their lighting sources, you know, there's a bias, a potential bias for them to over-report problems in the hopes of receiving a solar suitcase, which is what Surya kind of spoke to. And then likewise, during follow-up, you know, after they've received a solar suitcase and we ask them how how has that affected care? You know, there might be, again, uh, a bias to report a huge, huge improvement in the hopes of maybe receiving more equipment or solar suitcases. So I think, you know, one of the ways we try to address that is really the way you phrase things and letting them know that, you know, this isn't necessarily leading to other, you know, um, equipment or a donation. And then the other way we did it, which kind of Tom spoke to in terms of rigor of evidence is really working with a third party. So in the RCT, we explicitly wanted a third party, it was Innovations for Poverty Action, to conduct that research so that there's no potential of bias that We Care Solar is the one that's doing the research. Okay, thank you. So we've reached an hour, it's now 10 o'clock. Um, I'm gonna ask each of our panelists to sort of say any last comments that they would like to do. Um, uh, Arlene from One Heart Worldwide just wrote a comment saying that she'd like to make a comment. Arlene, I'm gonna go ahead and um, See if we can, can somebody unmute Arlene, please? Um, <clears throat> and then what we usually do right now is we're gonna open this up for more questions. <clears throat> we're not going away for the next 15 minutes. If you do need to get off, this is a good time. <clears throat> but can I have each of you maybe make a comment and then we'll take some more questions. Uh, let's start with you, Farouk. Uh, okay, uh, thank you, Laura. Uh, you know, again, I think uh, we cannot overemphasize uh, the importance of uh, uh, you know, research and data. Uh, we've been doing this work, uh, you know, for many, many, many years. Uh, uh, it's not always, you know, that we get, uh, uh, you know, all the, you know, the amount of dollars or all the inputs that we need. You know, I must say uh, that the very rigorous, uh, you know, pre-intervention assessment that we did uh, helped us a great deal 
in uh, you know, getting all the most important stakeholders from the ministries of health. We clearly showed them uh, you know, that the problems were that uh, you know, there were not the right numbers and uh, skills of health workers in the right places. Uh, the communities, we clearly showed uh, the, where the problems were uh, with regards to uh, not only health skill behavior, but uh, you know, also timely access uh, to emergency obstetric care when uh, complications arise. Uh, so, so uh, you know, the, the data or the research does not only uh, you know show us uh, you know when we have reached uh, impact. Uh, it also helps us to measure the quality of the work we are doing, and most importantly, I think it's a, a very very good uh, advocacy uh, tool. You know, to get uh, uh, you know all the right inputs aligned uh, for a very good uh, uh, project delivery. Thank you. Surya, would you like to have a comment? And I know we've unmuted Arlene. I know she has something she wants to say, who is your partner in health. I was gonna say partner in crime, but in partner in better health uh, <laughs> in the network of health. Well, I think, you know, the con lot of, you know, good conversation here about the, you know, issue challenges, you know, we, we do, you know, comprehensive, you know, model, which, you know, covers a lot of, you know, uh, different, you know, part of the mission of one health, you know, improving the access, increasing the quality, you know, there are a lot of, you know, components and, you know, a lot of, uh, you know, things you need to really do in order to really save the lives. But one of the things what I want to comment here is, um, yes, you know, it is very hard to measure the, you know, impact while, you know, we are doing social, you know, social interventions like this. Uh, there are so many confounders, there are so many other factors that is associated. And we do have a similar challenge here, you know, what really makes the most impact, what really, you know, you know, really saves the life. Yes, there are maybe it is your, you know, medicine or it is your, uh, you know, health worker it, or it is your light or it is your, you know, like, oh, so there's so many things. So what I just wanted to, you know, highlight is I think we need to have a, you know, comprehensive, you know, network of care. Yes, having the, you know, good, you know, health workers, they are trained, they have a, you know, resources, they have a medication, they have a running water, they have electricity, they have, you know, everything, whatever needed. And also they are well-trained, they're educated. Uh, so, you know, I think, you know, your support has been definitely, you know, helpful. And uh, one of the, you know, colleagues commented here, yes, you know, we do have over 200 plus solar suitcase in our, you know, facilities in Nepal. And we saw the, you know, when I go there, I check myself whether the light is working or not. You know, I ask them, you know, what is the benefit? They always speak high, even though there is electricity, which is not very reliable. And you know, when there is a you know, difficult time, it always works. It is very high quality light. That's what they call the fetal Doppler and all the things that is there. Yes, it was spoken very high about, you know, when we, we do talk to the staff and when, you, when we collect the quantitative data. Uh, so, you know, this has been a very, you know, interesting, you know, work together. Uh, but I think I just wanted to, you know, reiterate that we need to have a, you know, comprehensive care model if yeah. we truly want to save more life. Yeah, I always Thanks. like to say that the We Care Solar does not want to shine a light on bad care, and we see it as a necessary but not sufficient intervention. Uh, I will call on you, Arlene, but Tom has to leave, and I want to give him a moment as a panelist to say any last words before he signs off. Tom? Yeah, I think that, that that's a great segue to what I was going to say, which is I think all of this kind of you know, rigorous measure of the specific value of a certain intervention is really important because it can show the, the marginal differentiation. But ultimately, the way this will go to scale when you think of it in terms of the market dynamics it is, around, is around the proxy. And Christina was talking about that, the proxy outcomes. And what do we know has, a, has, a, has an aggregate impact on maternal and child health? Just to give a really great example, which I'm finding really exciting, we, we're seeing a huge growth in governments paying for results, buying outcomes, uh, and it's been exponential over the last decade. And we think the next decade, it will be even more exponential. Uh, and that means that organizations that can prove that what they do works cost effectively will start to get commissioned in these types of models. And to give you one example in, 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 in maternal and, and, uh, and, and uh, you know, infant mortality, We've been working with the US government in Northern Rajasthan, which has one of the highest rates of infant and maternal mortality. And the proxy that they're paying for, the result they're paying for, is a joint quality of care standard. 
at about $20,000, which of course should include all of the things everyone's mentioned, but clearly light should be, you know, it seems obvious that light would be part of that package, right? But it's, it's one of those things that perhaps, you know, is, is so obvious it hasn't been proven. And, and by proving it, it gets included, but then it gets commissioned and then it can be scaled. So I, I think uh, my, my, my message is keep investing in the research, keep proving that what you're doing is, is, is having such an amazing impact because you know, those of us who've been lucky enough to go and see it, it is. Um, and a funny anecdote just to leave you with, I used to, I used to uh, try and convince our clients at UBS about how effective the solar suitcase was by taking it around to meetings in London. And it is portable, but I think it's much better to go and see it in the field. So thank you very much for including me. I'm sorry I have to, I have to jump off. Thank you for being part of this, Tom, and thank you even more for all the support that you've given us to allow us to be able to collect data and, and show our impact. So thank you. Uh, we're going to still stay online a little bit longer. Arlene, I think you're no longer muted. Why don't you share with us what you'd like to say? I just wanted to say, I mean, what we have noticed in the 10 years in Nepal is that um, now we have 500 birthing centers that where it's really key and we have the solar suitcases, women are coming. So we're seeing a big increase in a facility based deliveries, but also prenatal care. And before there were before there was light there, they wouldn't come. They said, why should we go there when it's dark? So, you know, it for us it's been such a really great partnership with We Care Solar. And we've reached over 200,000 lives now and growing, scaling exponentially. So thank you for that, Laura. Oh, thank you. So Arlene, if for those of you who don't know, is or has been the executive director of One Heart Worldwide uh, for, I think, 20 years, two decades. Mm -hmm. uh, she's been saving lives in Tibet and Nepal and has created the most amazing model, the network of care that Surya was talking about. Um, so thank you. You've inspired us. Um, I'm going to go to some more of the questions in the chat. So Allegra asks whether there's been an expansion of benefits beyond maternal infant health, such as female health in general from better care, improved ed interest in education, emancipation. Uh, Christina, can you speak to maybe some of the spillover effects of having light in the health facility? And maybe even you could touch upon the light in, in health in, in education institutions that We Care Solar also supports. Yeah, I think it's a really interesting question. Um, one thing outside of direct health impacts, um, we know that health workers are much more empowered, much more confident when they have light. So there's this whole component of producing an environment that's really productive for health workers. We know that the solar suitcase or having light at the facility can make sure that the health workers are staying at the facility, that they're not going elsewhere. So there is an effect that we see directly on the health workers. But, but one thing I would note that, um, that I think we have a spillover effect in terms of uh, uh, beyond health is actually our training program. So I mentioned that we actually pay subcontractors to do installation. So we actually work with solar installers in country, um, train them, and then make sure that we have a team that's really the highest quality team to do installation. So we are you know, producing employment opportunities for local companies in country for opportunities for that. And we're actually exploring to do that with a whole, uh, an all of female installation team in uh, Sierra Leone right now. And then of course we have um, our WeShare program, which does lighting. Um, it focuses on STEM education in the United States. Um, teachers teach students here the STEM program and they actually design the blue solar suitcase. And then those are deployed to facilities, not facilities, excuse me, education centers, orphanages abroad that need lighting as well. And, and I'll just also um, mention, I had just gotten back from Zimbabwe before all the travel restrictions came about because of COVID. And one thing that really struck me, even though our focus is maternal and newborn health, the lights that are provided by the solar suitcase provide the best lights for the entire facility. And in the facilities I visited, the, the lights were being used at night for a range of things. The fact that we have mobile lights means that you can actually move lights from the maternity ward, for example, to another triage area. They were being used for kids being evaluated for pneumonia, for giving vaccinations at night, for treating trauma cases, for suturing, for bandages. So in what I've seen is that the solar suitcase literally uplifts the health facility. The other thing that we've seen, Allegra, is that sometimes 
the health facility now becomes like the community center, particularly in communities where there is not good electrification. So students may come and do their homework there. It, it really does change expectations. And one of the things, I, I did this installation once in a very small community in Sierra Leone. I arrived in the middle of the night and um, you know there was no electricity and we had to present the solar suitcase to the chief. And when we flipped on the lights, everyone in the community was there and they just started just, they were just jubilant. And the fact is that we love the fact that the solar suitcase is introducing electricity and clean, reliable electricity, solar electricity. So people are for the first time seeing that there can be a type of electricity that is not harmful to the environment, that's a sustainable, that uses a free source of fuel, the, the sun. So I do think that it really has empowered communities in a number of ways and also raised awareness about things like solar electricity. Uh, I think that we've actually answered all of the other questions that I saw come on to me. Uh, raise your hand or send something in chat if you have any other. Oh, there was a question about expansion into India um, from Babu Raman. Thanks for that question and specifically Bangladesh. Um, it takes a lot for us to start a program in a new country. When we started out, and this was my husband and I and a few volunteers, literally people would come to my house and they might take a solar suitcase to India. In fact, there's three that are in India from individuals wanting to start approaches. Now that we are intent on light every birth, we are really interested in scalable programs at a national scale. We would be very happy to do work in Bangladesh or India, but it requires a significant amount of funding for us to do that baseline landscape that Christina has talked about and to really put people and um, resources in place to have an effective program. One of the things that any of you working in rural healthcare in Africa know or in around the world is that there are a lot of well-meaning donors that will give a piece of equipment and not really think about the entire ecosystem and how to support that equipment over time. So there's a lot of broken equipment in health facilities or things that are sitting in storage rooms that have never been used. And for us to create a programs that can allow solar suitcases, not just to arrive at a facility, but that can be used well, that people are trained to use them, that technicians are trained to install and take care of them, that takes significant resources. So for us to enter a new country, we would need to have partners on the ground we can work with and funders that are really willing to support a fairly large program. Uh, could one of the assistants put online my email as well as the info at address so anybody that has additional questions can ask? Christina, I didn't let you give your last word. So why don't you end the session with, with your reflections from this last hour and 15 minutes? All right, well, it's been really uh, interesting hearing everyone talk and thank you for all that attended and all the panelists for contributing. I, I guess I would reflect on just something that uh, to think about. I think, you know, in reality, collecting data and using data has cost implications and it's very resource intensive. So I think when thinking about this, it's really important to think about what data do you actually need to, to collect and make sure that you're using that data. So you're not collecting data and then just sitting there not being used. And the one other thing that I would kind of reflect on, I think um, the best practices for We Care Solar has been really instrumental in changing the way that we are. And it really has led to us to be able to scale to the place that we are. And by having evidence-based implementation, we know that we're doing programming at the highest quality level. However, that doesn't mean that it's set in stone. I think you need to be flexible and, and not just assume that just because you have this data, it's always right. You know, there's still this the flexibility of learning and growing and being open to um, new assumptions and new learnings. And that's something that I think is really important to keep in mind when thinking about research and especially best practices approach. Well, thank you. I have learned so much. I am so grateful to all of you for your partnership. We'll be sending out to all of you who registered, we'll send out a link to a copy of this if you missed any parts and you'd like to see the whole thing. Uh, Farouk and Surya, can we share your emails with people who may have specific questions for you? Just raise your hand if that's okay and we'll do that too. Um, okay, fantastic. So we can we see ourselves as a whole community of learners. Thank you for joining us and hearing about our journey of learning and Please join us next week. Next week, we're going to have an amazing panel that's going to be on the power of finance. That's really going to talk about how do we fund these programs? How do we create sustainable programs? We have a, a special page on our website. If you go to wecaresolar.org and then go to 10 by 10, there's actually a 
site that will show you all of the rest of the sessions that we have. We have a, a number of excellent sessions coming up. And thank you again for joining us today. Bye now.